Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. An Oakland County family business hit by thieves who ripped auto parts right off the work trucks that, uh, need, that they need to do their job. Last year, the flu was largely a non-factor, but there are signs it could be primed for a comeback. Is it safe to go home? Evacuated homeowners in Flat Rock waiting for answers as the state considers how to hold Ford accountable for an underground fuel leak. Glad you're with us tonight at 6. We told you at 5 about the good news of tests showing lower levels of toxic benzene in the sewer system in Flat Rock. That's progress, right. but there's a lot more testing needed before people's homes can be declared safe again. Local 4 defender Sean Lay is in Flat Rock with more on that process. But first, new developments involving the underground fuel leak and how and when it was reported. Right, Sean? Absolutely. Let's also show you what's happening right now. There's the Ford assembly plant right here in Flat Rock. Flat Rock, look over my shoulder. When they're going to have it all cleaned up? Viola Humphreys is in Flat Rock. She feels good. She's not going to evacuate right now. But so far, more than 500 vouchers have been given to Flat Rock homeowners for them to stay at hotels while the emergency of Ford fuel leaking into the sewer systems here, causing toxic fumes in some homes gets cleaned up. Viola wants to know when the all clear will be given. What caused it? What's what's the problem? How soon will it be done? Tonight, we're also learning that progress in Flat Rock is being made. Ongoing monitoring is showing that the benzene levels are to trace levels, um, but you know, we're, we're still flushing the sewer system. You know, you're going to see people popping the manholes, uh, putting hoses down there um, and pushing that along. The state environmental Great Lakes and Energy Division is now also turning its attention to Ford and its Flat Rock assembly plant. Ford has apologized for the gas leak. Eagle wants to know when exactly was it discovered, who was notified, and Eagle intends on holding Ford accountable as it expands its investigation to now include testing Flat Rock's water quality. So the city and environmental uh, agencies were working on gathering uh, water samples and getting that tested just out of an abundance of caution. We're back here live in Flat Rock. That team right behind me testing the sewer lines right across the street from the assembly plant for the fourth time today on this little side street. And we're finally getting some answers to the questions we've been asking when Ford reported the leak. Local Ford defender Karen Drew, she just got this timeline before the six o'clock hour from Eagle. That Wednesday, Eagle did a preemptive inspection at the Ford plant right across the street here to see if they could find the source of the fumes people were smelling around town. Thursday, it was an anonymous tip that sent Eagle right back inside the Ford plant. Also Thursday, Ford says it found the leak Wednesday after the inspector left and then reported the leak Thursday when Eagle came back. And that is a leak that has certainly turned lives upside down here in Flat Rock. Back to you guys. And so many questions remain to be answered. All right, Sean, thanks. Another big increase to report the latest coronavirus numbers. The state reporting 2,364 new cases of COVID-19 over these last 24 hours. That's the highest single day count that we've seen since May. 51 more deaths also being reported, including 10 from a vital records review. State's vaccination rate sitting at 66.3%. State's health department has updated its quarantine guidance for vaccinated and unvaccinated students. First, the department says any student who tests positive for COVID-19 should isolate and follow directions from their local health department. Anyone who has symptoms and this is regardless of vaccine status, should be tested and isolate as directed. The guidelines for asymptomatic students varies. For example, a fully vaccinated student who was exposed can stay in school if they wear a mask, monitor symptoms, and get tested three to five days after exposure. Unvaccinated students are more likely to need to quarantine depending on the circumstances of the exposure. You can read through this entire list of guidelines. We've got them right now on the homepage of clickondetroit.com. The crime itself wasn't captured on camera, but a local business owner says this video shows thieves arriving to steal crucial auto parts right off his trucks. According to police in Rochester Hills, this wasn't the only business hit. Larry Spruill is live with more on this ring of thefts, Larry. Good evening, Kimberly and Devin. Many don't know what's under the hood of a car, but each part helps the vehicle run. Now, one local business says thieves targeted their work vehicles, stealing the parts. They knew what they wanted and how valuable it was, and it was not 
under the hood. Well, we took off for the weekend. Um, came back and started trucks up. Sometime on Saturday, our um, the catalytic converters to nine of our trucks were cut out. But owner Ralph Putman and manager Samantha Johnson say they did not notice anything until Tuesday because they were closed for Labor Day. Couldn't drive them that morning. Putman says they also found out that these did not target not one or two trucks, but nine trucks at the local family-owned plumbing company. I think they're around $800 each says Putman and that the catalytic converters are popular items that are stolen off vehicles after realizing the magnitude of everything they checked out their security cameras you can see that these drive to the back of the business and stop uh, so they knew where to park you know so it just seemed like they kind of scouted the area they got it sawed in two but they weren't able to get it out the business says it only took minutes for the thieves to come back here where the vans are and all they needed was a saw to get under the truck and cut the catalytic converter in just seconds. We were definitely not the only one, so. It was a little concerning, you know, because it hit a lot of business. And police said the thieves also targeted several businesses in that area over the weekend, stealing a variety of items. We are live in Oakland County tonight. Larry Sproul, Local 4. Okay, Larry, thanks. Much calmer day of weather so far after rough and tumble night yeah, again last night. Last night, yeah, but uh, we can expect things to heat up again soon, right, Paul? Yeah, I tell you, you know, when you have tornado warnings, it's very unnerving, but fortunately that's all past us. And right now, Storm Tracker 4 is just showing a few isolated showers. Now, last hour, we focused on the one little teeny downpour that went right across 696. This time, let's go right across Santa Lac County here, and we'll uh, talk about that. You can see the little splash and dashers here. They're, some of them have some downpours, but they're kind of. They come and they go and then they're just gone. I mean, they're just little splash and dashes, we like to call them. But let's talk about temperatures. If most of us are, have a dry evening right now. 77 in the city of Detroit in our metro zone, 78 in Taylor, 77 in Livonia, 75 in Canton. In our south zone, we have 76 in Dundee, 75 in Saline, 75 in Adrian. In our west zone, hey, good afternoon, Whitmore Lake. You have 72 degrees, 74 in Howell, 73 in Manchester. And in our north zone, look at this. Deckerville, you're at 66 degrees right now, 72 in Melvin, and we have 73 over in Oxford. So overall, for those of us in the heart of the area that are in the mid 70s right now, we're going to drop from those very quickly down into the 60s this evening. The wind will settle down as well. Just again, those isolated showers for the next hour or two, then those are gone. All right, don't forget the local forecasters app has real time radar. So whether it's a big line of storms like last night or these little splash and dashers we had this afternoon. It's all right there in the palm of your hand. Just go to the App Store, search under WDIV, and best of all, it is F-R-E-E -E free. See you back here in a few minutes, guys. Last year's flu season, you know, essentially never really arrived, but there is growing concern that we won't be so lucky this year. New predictions as the pieces are in place for a severe flu season, though experts caution there are several X factors that we'll have to watch. Dr. Frank McGeorge will be one of those watchers. He's here with a closer look at what we could be up against. Frank. Yeah, Devin, so this time last year, there were grave warnings of a potential twindemic of flu and COVID, but those predictions that we had in place to prevent the spread of COVID proved to be extremely effective at preventing the spread of flu. Now, with most of those precautions no longer being taken, though, there is once again concern as we head into flu season. A new model from the University of Pittsburgh suggests this flu season could be severe. In two preprint studies, researchers calculated the flu could result in as many as 600,000 hospitalizations. By comparison, about 200,000 people are generally hospitalized with the flu each year. The prediction is a worst-case scenario, assuming a highly contagious flu strain and low flu vaccination rates. But experts say a combination of factors could make this winter particularly tough. Many people aren't wearing masks and have stopped social distancing. Children are back in school. And since the flu was almost non-existent last year, fewer people will have any natural leftover immunity this flu season. The viruses are around here and they may take off once we get into the winter season. Dr. Arnold Monto is a world-renowned flu expert at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He cautions flu is notoriously tough to predict, but we should all be prepared. I don't like to talk about a potential flu season, but we really need to keep people thinking about flu as we get into the vaccination season. 
Now, the best protection against the flu is to get a flu shot, and it's recommended you get it by the end of October. Now, many people have asked if you can get your flu shot at the same time as a COVID booster. The CDC says, yes, you can get both at the same time. However, if you'd prefer not to, you can also space them out by at least 14 days. Frank, I heard someone recently mention issue, uh, an issue that I find fascinating. The lack of a flu last year, does that end up having an impact on the effectiveness of the flu vaccines this year? Yeah, Devin, it certainly could. You know, the lack of data made picking the flu strains for this year's yeah. vaccines to protect against more challenging. And that decision had to be made back in March. So this year's shots, of course, they do include two updates, but it remains to be seen how well they're going to match up with the flu viruses that actually end up circulating this winter. Really Just high stakes prognosticating going on here. Yeah. All right, Doc. A garbage truck crashes into a building revealing an illegal marijuana grow operation in Sterling Heights. The crash happened around 530 this morning near 15 Mile and Mound Road. A driver cut off a GFL truck, causing its driver to lose control and crash into the building. Inside, police found more than 250 marijuana plants. The people growing the plants have medical marijuana cards, but commercial grows like this are not legal in Sterling Heights. I had the record-breaking donation to the school that calls itself the most diverse in all of Metro Detroit. Also, when we think of the 9-11 heroes, we, of course, think of firefighters, police officers. There's one you might not think of as often, dentist. Up next, we meet a Metro Detroiter who was there to do a crucial yet rarely mentioned job on the side of the fallen Twin Towers. As we go to break, we remember some of the people with Michigan connections who lost their lives in the attacks 20 years ago.